welcome, 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 everybody. Uh, this is episode three of Real World uh, Network Forensics. The good news is that, uh, well, I have lots of good news, but one piece of good news is that we have packet captures. Um, so Endace has been nice enough to sponsor these, uh, these webcasts. We did uh, one where we covered uh, network forensics around HTTP and HTTPS. Uh, we did another with RPC and SMB. And today we're going to talk, uh, talk about IMAP and uh, SMTP get into the email side. Uh, now, uh, one of the things that I love about this, and, and by the way, too, I, I cannot say enough good, uh, enough good things about, uh, uh, enough good things about the uh, end days. Um, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I guess what I'll say here is that the majority of the time when I do these, these webinars, and I, I love working, you know, with all the vendors that we have on webinars and whatnot. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's rare that somebody comes in and says, hey, look, right, we want to educate the community because we know um, that, uh, you know, we know that when folks understand how to do network analysis better, um, they're going to want to capture more packets. And what do you know? We have the solution for that. Right? As a matter of fact, I wrote a white paper form, um, and we're actually going through that tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon. So same bat times. Well, it's not the same bat time, same bat channel, but you get the idea. Tomorrow uh, here uh, with Sands, uh, we'll go through the, uh, the results of that white paper um, and use cases around maybe some unconventional, not maybe, some unconventional use cases. Um, around packet capture and uh, packet capture as well. Uh, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. I want to tease that for tomorrow. Uh, but today we're going to do some, uh, well, network analysis with SMTP and, and IMAP. Um, so this is our agenda for today. Um, I'm leaving this up here for a moment. As a matter of fact, I'm going to grab, you know, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab this so I can put it in chat. I should have done this a second ago. Pardon me. I don't want you to have to type all that out. Let's see. Now I can find the chat and everyone there we go all right so okay now we've got the link now we're set to go uh, if you want to play along uh, endace has been nice enough to create these packet captures and they've allowed me to share them with everybody um, so that you can go back and do the analysis that and again i just i've been doing this for i mean gosh what i joined sans eight years ago now um and uh I, this is the first time a vendor's ever been like hey Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go educate the community. I mean, just like straight educate the community. And I'm loving this. So anyway, um, they generated these packet captures. Uh, we're going to go through again, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about uh, talk about SMTP and IMAP. Uh, you'll get a little bit of education on SPF and DKIM. Uh, we'll even talk a little bit about DMARC, although from, you know, that, that's on the preventative side, DMARC matters a lot. On the investigation side, I care a lot more about SPF and DKIM. Yeah, as you think about it, kind of put together there, it's just the reporting side that the DMARC gives us. Talk a little about IMAP, uh, wrap up some closing thoughts here. But again, I wanted to make sure everybody had a copy of this or could go download those packet captures if you so desire. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, two of those packet captures have malware in them, right? So, um, you know, this is a, uh, these are, are very, uh, well, they're phishing examples, right? And they're very real world, as it turns out, um, because they have malware in them. Um, so much so um, that uh, when I did some of the, uh, you know, some of the prep for this um, and looking at some of these packet captures, I'm a big WSL fan. Uh, so the Windows services for Linux are technically WSL2 uh, now because the old uh, subsystem for Linux is, is uh, services for Linux, subsystem for Linux. Uh, it used to be services for Unix, right? But uh, anyway, uh, as I was uh, doing some uh, some analysis, I was you know decoding the attachment out of base sixty four. If you're not familiar with that, you will be by the end of the end of the uh, webinar here. Um, and as I'm decoding, um, the the files are just gone, right? And and so on the services for Linux side or the uh, subsystem for Linux side, excuse me, um, it's showing a zero byte file. Um, and so I've got zero byte file on on WSL and on the Windows side because it's a shared drive. There's just nothing. Right. And so Defender was like, oh, yeah, I see what's going on there. Wow. Right. Just taking those files out. So I did want to mention that um, it was really interesting. I don't I don't know exactly the, the mechanism here. And this might be something interesting to kind of think about in the future uh, for some future research there. But I didn't get Defender alerts around it. Uh, the files just disappeared. I mean, I could go find the Defender alerts, but it wasn't a big pop up. So the reason I'm telling you this is if, if you are in. Uh, the Linux subsystem on Windows, and you're just like, hey, game on, this is going to be awesome, right? Um, you may not see alerts, right, that, that your files are disappearing and maybe cursing my name. You're like, none of this stuff works. So you're going to see an Ubuntu VM, an actual VM, right? Um, a place where Defender cannot go, right? Um, so you'll see me in an actual VM for this. But I did want to throw out there that, you know, again, it, there, 
there are malware samples in there or, or things that flag as, as malware specifically, um, you, you know the deal with this, right? Just like with anything else you do with SANS, um, you know, well, anything else you do with SANS, right? Um, it's, uh, you know, you often have uh, live stuff there. You should be very careful and play at your own risk. Um, that said, again, there's there's minimal risk here. You would have to do lots of decoding steps and then be like, hey, now I'm gonna, gonna go double click and open that file, let's go, all right? Okay, um, so I wanna start out here um, and come back to a uh, come back to a topic that we've we've hit a couple of times in previous uh, previous webcasts, but I'm gonna assume that you haven't been here for all of these. Um, and I'd like to start with the importance of packet capture. I wanna note here um, that today's intrusions are increasingly complex in nature. Um, analysts are being asked increasingly to discuss what data was viewed by the threat actor in addition to exfiltration. Now, if I roll back a few years ago, right, and, and I'm not saying that we were right then, we were totally wrong, we were so wrong, but we were, uh, we were asked repeatedly, we're like, did, did the threat actor take it out of the network? And it's like, well, I mean, does it matter, right? I mean, if we think about the Facebook, uh, you know, some of the Facebook uh, documents getting smuggled out, um, you know, a lot of that was by, by phone, right? So taking, taking screenshots, uh, I say screenshots, uh, photos of, of what's on screen. Uh, well, okay, right? So what was viewed by the threat actor, right? Um, and, and this is really important for us, right? Because packet capture can show this in a way that endpoint forensics often can't. Um, so, so where did the threat actor go? If we're in east-west uh, traffic, now if I only have NetFlow, hey, maybe I can turn and say, and, and I say only have NetFlow, tune in tomorrow because we will talk about, um, you know, some of the benefits that we can get, you know, with that. But packet capture, I mean, there's no substitute for, for full packet capture, right? Um, and, and if you've ever been to a security conference, you know all about this, right? You see people consistently, I see people at least, walking around with a t-shirt that says PCAP or it didn't happen. In fact, I probably should have worn that shirt for this, uh, it doesn't have a collar on it, but, but I totally should have worn that shirt for this, uh, for this webcast. Um, that said, I've never seen the corresponding endpoint or it didn't happen, disk image or it didn't happen, right? Nobody says that. Um, and, and I think that there's, you know, several reasons for that. One of them being that, you know, disk image is kind of table stakes, I guess, or the idea that we could get a disk image, whereas packet captures, and, and, and two, a disk image is something I can go get after the fact. I don't have to prep for this. I just have to be ready to take an actual disk image, whereas packet capture, I've got one bite at the apple, right? And I have to prepare, right? And that's one of the, we talk about proactive security versus reactive, that, that this is where the rubber meets the road, right? Um, the, the reality is that threat actors are increasingly complex. They are uh, engaging in anti-forensics on the endpoint. I even gave a talk back in 2019 that, you know, we kind of debated around whether or not it was appropriate, but, but basically walking people through how to false flag, uh, you know, how to false flag cyber intrusions. That was, now, I won't say all on the endpoint. There was a couple of things that we played with on the network, but but in totality, right? Um, you know, the network stuff. Again, if you've got packet capture, you would immediately be like, ah ha ha, they're they're playing games, right? Uh, versus on the endpoint, it becomes much 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 more difficult. So, packet show ground truth through intrusion. Bottom line, important done. All right. Want to also talk about operationalizing packet capture, right? So. Um, this is a big one for me. Uh, a lot of times folks get a bunch of IOCs and they're like, hey, how do I really operationalize these? You can go search all day long, right? Search is, and, and capture for that matter is, is typically, uh, well, I won't say not the problem, we have to enable it. But as we go and we look at, um, you know, searching against, uh, you know, against data, um, you know, data has to be indexed to, to get efficient search, right? Uh, otherwise, we're, we're just barreling through terabytes and terabytes of packet capture. Um, and so what I like to know ahead of trying to go operationalize an IOC is what fields do I have indexed in my packet capture? That's going to change what types of IOCs I'm going after, or maybe I'm creating new indexes. But I, bottom line here, I, I want you to think about as you begin trying to operationalize an IOC, particularly in an investigative context, right? Um, you know, I want to be able to filter or vector in fairly quickly um, you know, on, on fields again that, that are that are already indexed. And once I've done that, and you can almost think about this like bivariate analysis, right? So I'm, I'm basically taking a first cut, whether that's a time window or whether that is uh, some indexed field, maybe a source or a destination IP address, and I'm cutting against that, then I can go brute force through, you know, this much, much, much smaller, right? Orders of magnitude smaller uh, packet capture. And I say brute force, but basically that's that's what we're doing is, is searching through the entirety of, of that capture. Um, so 
Um, again, uh, we can then take selected data, and that's what we're going to be looking at today is selected data, um, you know, out of uh, what would otherwise be captured on the wire. Uh, that's what we'll look at today. But that said, I did want to introduce you to Endace UI, right? So this is the user interface um, for Endace. Uh, or, or one of the user interfaces, I guess the core user interface for Endace. Um, and we can go through and we can filter on uh, these index fields, like my source port, my destination port, we can filter on time ranges, as well as source and destination IP addresses. Um, and this allows us to get in now, you'll notice here, like, I, I have some ability to see some, uh, you know, to, to see some uh, visualization of quantity of traffic, and, and again, you know, what am I filtering around? How much data is there? Um, now, again, in my lab environment, we 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 don't have as much data obviously as we would have in a in a real, particularly in east west uh, east west capture. But you'll notice here in the bottom, uh, in the bottom right of this, let me see if I can get my pen. There we go. Uh, so you'll notice over here this this ability now that I've filtered. Uh, I can say, hey, let, let me go download this packet capture. Um, and, and some folks are like, hey, just give me everything from this time range, right? Um, that's a noob mistake right there because if you've got several gigabytes in Wireshark, um, you know, one uh, that filter that filter is going to take forever, and Wireshark's going to crash. I mean, that that's pretty much pretty much par for the course, um, but but separately, you know, as you go to filter, even if Wireshark by some miracle doesn't crash with gigabyte, you know, gigabyte plus packet captures uh, while you're filtering and changing filters, um, it'll just take forever, right? So, so the more that I can filter initially and get that cut down to a, a, a relatively small amount of traffic that I then want to analyze, the better off I'm going to be from a, uh, well, completing my analysis standpoint. Uh, now, you'll notice here too, I don't want this to go, uh, you know, to go unnoticed, uh, two, two notes here, right? One, um, the ability to look and say, hey, that traffic, that's interesting. And even if we're on, let's say a seven day, uh, seven day or a 14 day or whatever uh, kind of, uh, you know, rotation or retention, I may look and say, I may not need this immediately now. I may not be like so much I'm exporting it, downloading it, what have you. But, but I do want to archive it. I do want to go ahead and, and save this packet capture indefinitely uh, so it doesn't roll off the back end, right? Um, this, this is a feature that uh, I wish that I'd had repeatedly during investigations. I'm not going to call out, you know, vendor uh, specifics here, but, but I, I've been in investigations. I remember one time we had a 60-day retention. Uh, this has been a couple of years back. We had a 60-day retention, um, and we found out that because the wrong fields had been indexed, or more accurately, that almost no fields have been indexed, uh, and, and the two that had been didn't really matter for us. Um, it was taking us on a 60-day retention, it was taking us somewhere in the neighborhood of, I believe, 18-ish hours to, uh, to complete a search um, across that. And uh, as we ran to the end of the 60-day window, we, we like all incidents, of course, we got called in on like day 45, right? Um, and so, you know, you're looking at it, and you're like, do I stop capturing today with an intrusion that we haven't fully contained yet, or do we let that stuff roll off the back because he didn't have the archive capability? Um, separately, export was a giant pain in the rear there as well. Um, but I also uh, had to do lots of exporting because I, in order to do any higher level analysis, uh, the only way to do it was outside of the platform. And so this is another space where I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give Endace a big fist bump. Um, and by the way, uh, Mark from Endace is on uh, with us. And if you have specific questions about that, um, he's, I'm sure, in the chat. Uh, and if you're interested, just uh, throw questions in the chat or questions in general. Um, and I feel like Marcus is, is, is going to jump on those uh, 100%. So that said, um, Mark's like, I'm here, right? No, I, I, Mark, I knew you were there, man. We're, we're set. I could see you there. We're, we're all we're all there. So, uh, but integrated Wireshark. And the thing that I like about this, again, is that if I just need to do a quick check of, hey, man, like, what is in this capture that, you know, before I do the full, you know, download and, and, and particularly if I'm in a remote office, this is another spot where I'm regularly VPNing into my own office uh, to, uh, you know, basically to do any type of monitoring. Um, you know, obviously, uh, if I can do something locally and display that GUI back, and again, this is all over a web browser, um, then I don't have to go download gigabytes of packet capture only to load those in Wireshark or, or even let's say, forget it's not gigabytes, let's say it's uh, 20 megabytes of packet capture, I load it in Wireshark only to find out it's not what I wanted, right? It's not what I thought was going to be in there. 
Again, right here, no problem. This happens all on the Endace probe. Um, and again, it just launches Wireshark for you there. Now, I do want to mention that as I do analysis today, uh, I'm going to be doing it in a standalone Wireshark. And that's just because, you know, we're already in a VM and we're going to be in the matrix very quickly here where I'm like layer upon layer upon layer. Um, but, uh, but just know that, again, this is a capability that's here and it's extremely useful uh, when we get into, uh, get into analysis. So all that said, let's talk about email protocols because I, I, I've jumped up about how to do packet, packet analysis and I've given Endace some props, uh, but they deserve them straight up. I mean, not only is the product awesome, but again, they're giving us the opportunity to talk about, well, another 43 minutes of packet capture analysis. So uh, actually, uh, since we've had a few more folks join, I did want to mention I just dropped in the chat there. Um, that is the link for all of the packet captures that we'll be looking at today. Um, so if you want to go grab those, feel free. And there are two other uh, sets there, the SMB um, uh, there, meaning like one up repo. Um, but uh, it's the SMB webcast that we did as well as the HTTP webcast. And you can find those in the SANS webcast archive. Um, and ACE was, was nice enough to sponsor those for us as well. OK, so let's talk about email protocols. Um, there's really three here that I have to discuss and, and, and have to, I honestly can cut one of them out because I, I don't want to say pop three is never used, but it's, it's old, it's, it's long in the tooth and, and I just don't see it used, uh, used anymore. SMTP, on the other hand, uh, this is used to send email between MTAs or mail transfer agents, email servers, right? Um, so SMTP is what we see being used to go send mail. Um, not to be confused with the send mail daemon, but to send email. Um, and POP3 and IMAP were used to go retrieve email. And here you're using uh, an MUA or a mail user agent, right? Um, so mail user agent is effectively your email program, aka Outlook or Thunderbird or whatever it is that you use today. Now, if you're in a web browser, all this, I mean, how it's done in the background, like, you know, for a Gmail or Yahoo Mail, does anybody use Yahoo Mail? Anymore? Anyway, whatever, for, for whatever those, those other webmail browsers are, obviously you're sending via SMTP. I suspect there's probably some IMAP on the back end, but if you're doing network analysis, and I'm just preempting the question here, the obvious question, if you're doing network analysis, you're, you're going to have to be in HTTP. Good news, we already did that one, right? Um, so you're going to go and do that level of analysis uh, because you can't see this. This is abstracted away from you. For the rest of us, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about what we can and can't see, uh, can and can't see on the wire. So again, IMAP, uh, POP3 is the old, um, you know, the, the oldness, um, and IMAP is 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 the newer uh, the newer hotness. Uh, the reason that you see IMAP, uh, just if you're interested from a trivia kind of standpoint here, um, you know, POP3 we had to go download the whole message, right? So um, you know, and and you had the option to leave a copy on the server, um, you know, so that if you had multiple MUAs, you know, maybe I've got several machines and and they all want to sync and the you know, like I, I need the email on on multiple downloaded to multiple machines. It's it's not super efficient. It really wasn't built around. It was built honestly, thinking about like the computing uh, architecture of yesteryear. Um, and, you know, as we've moved past that, uh, you need a way to synchronize across multiple devices uh, and, and get all that set. And that, that's where IMAP comes in, right? Uh, so here, you're not downloading every message from uh, every message from the server. Um, now, this, in an investigative standpoint, can cause lots of confusion, but I'll actually show you how to, how to take a look at this from an analysis standpoint uh, momentarily. Um, but I'll mention here that, uh, you know, with IMAP, um, you are typically, well, I guess in almost every case, you're leaving a copy of the message on the server. Um, what is important to know is that when you download a message, often you're not downloading the full message, right? Um, and you've probably experienced this before. If you've been on like a, uh, you tried to access your email from a flight, right? Um, and uh, you've got, uh, you know, you've got your Thunderbird open um, and it shows you several messages and you click on a message and it wait, 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 waits. And you're like, what the heck? Didn't you download the message? Well, kind of, right? They downloaded like the subject line and the sender and the you know, attachment name and the, right? But the email ain't there, right? And so when you click on it, right? And this is great just from an efficiency standpoint, particularly if you're thinking about, if you're thinking about these, right? You got a good mobile phone and, you know, I don't want mobile bandwidth like dragging all of my email down to the phone. I only have so much bandwidth and I only have so much space, right? Um, and so here, uh, effectively, I'm only downloading messages on demand, but I'm seeing the, the channel preview, if you will, or the, the message lineup. Um, and IMAP, again, just supports all of that transparently. Now, uh, by default, all these protocols use plain text transmission, although SSL encrypted versions exist, right? So 
That said, um, I'm going to leave this just as a reference slide here because, I mean, it's good reference, but, you know, we're not going to deep dive into any of this other than, uh, well, we'll talk about SMTP and we'll take a look at IMAP. Um, now, you know, the secure versions, as you can imagine, kind of like HTTPS is now the default, uh, IMAP secure is, is, is the default, right? Um, so, you know, like anything else you're doing in network traffic, um, if you're capturing encrypted traffic, uh, you need to make sure that you have a way to go and decrypt that uh, decrypt that data. Um, so just just throwing that out there. Um, and, and oftentimes this is done either through a load balancer or a, a TLS uh, gateway where you're doing some TLS break and inspect. But again, that's beyond the scope of what we're doing here. We want to get into the packets, the packets themselves. Now, I'd be remiss as we get into SMTP to not talk about SPF and DKIM. And the reason for this is that when we get into SMTP, remember SMTP is where we're sending messages, right? That sounds a lot to me like if I'm the investigator, I'm investigating phishing, right? That's the, I mean, vast majority of the time. Although there have been situations, right? Uh, vendor email compromise or VEC um, is another one. If you're not familiar with that term, uh, VEC is where you have somebody who effectively is, is, clean, is, is jumping into an email thread typically into an email thread. Um, they've compromised your vendor's email, right? Or they've compromised our email and they're using our email account to go victimize a, a business partner, right? Um, and oftentimes what we'll do is we'll jump into the middle of a thread and, you know, basically where there's been an invoice, uh, you know, that's been sent, but hasn't been paid yet. You can see where this goes, right? They're like, hey, update to our banking information. Woohoo! And anyway, um, so why does this matter? Right. Well, look, obviously, um, that's one way to pull off the attack. And, and it's it's fairly complex. Right. The other one is just to spoof the user. Right. It's to spoof. I say spoof the user, but spoof accounts payable at, you know, company name dot com. Well, OK, now I have a separate now I have a separate question. Right. Was that actually spoofed or was it not? And SPF is designed to prevent that. SPF is designed to prevent that spoofing. Um, and, and that prevention is done by the receiving server. So the receiving server, if configured, is going to use an SPF lookup right, uh, to determine, hey, the server that sent this email, is it a valid server for this domain, the domain it claims to be sending from? All right, so to give you an example, right, I own the malwarejake.com domain, right? Um, now I don't have SPF set up for that because I don't have email set up for it and all that. But if I did, right, um, I would say basically, here are the email servers that are allowed to send from malwarejake.com. And if anybody else tries to spoof, the receiving server can check the allowed list. This is done over DNS, right? Um, and it can check the allowed list of servers that are configured currently um, to go and, and allow to send. Now, the reason I bring this up a lot is that there's a kind of a non-repudiation issue here. Now, SPF is something, you know, bear in mind here, if we're talking about a VEC, we're talking about I'm being victimized, right, um, by this vendor. And the question is, could the threat actor have spoofed the email, right, or not? Now, if SPF is properly configured, I can say either that call came from inside your house or, or, right, there's uh, somebody tried, you know, basically um, either the call came from inside the house or, uh, you know, the SPF is, is misconfigured, right? But if SPF is locked down, I know the only place that email could have come from are those authorized servers, right? So this then limits the scope of my investigation. You can imagine as I'm investigating, if I can point to the vendor and say, hey, man, or, or I say the vendor, but like the, this external organization and say, hey, like, look, based on your SPF config, right? Um, here's what, uh, you know, here are the existing servers that could send. This is the list of servers that can send. We think you have a problem because if you've ever called somebody to try to do a third party notification, you know immediately like that that is a, that is a hard, uh, hard nut to crack, right? Um, so the reason I bring this up is when we do packet analysis and we look at email headers, it's no problem to, and, and even take packet capture out for a second. When I look at email headers, I can see, did the server process the SPF, my receiving server, did it process the SPF check or not? And did the SPF check succeed or fail? That gets logged in the headers. What I don't see is I don't see the SPF lookup. That's not logged. And so the reason this becomes an issue here and why packet capture is a big deal, and I wanna highlight this here and make sure that we don't lose sight of this because we've talked about a lot of, well, SPF, um, but I wanna make sure that we don't lose, that we don't lose sight of this um, when my mail server does that SPF lookup over DNS, 
right? It's, it's making the decision based on that point in time. Now, if three days later, somebody says, oh my gosh, we've got a problem, and I go investigate, I'm doing another lookup. I'm, I'm, I am definitely going to do the lookup. I'm going to do that comparison. But that tells me what it looks like now, not three days ago when the email was, was received, right? Um, by the way, too, if our OPSEC was bad and we've already kind of thrown some accusations around about like the, hey, maybe it was your stuff, maybe it was my stuff, whatever. Um, well, we never say maybe it was my stuff, but uh, you know, it may well be that folks are updating their SPM configs, right? So this is a spot where packet capture uh, comes in super useful. And as you're looking at SMTP, I want you to make sure that uh, you capture DNS uh, coming off, particularly if you already have capture filters in play, make sure that you're grabbing the DNS that comes off that server as well, or you miss out on SPF. Okay, so SPF anti-spoofing. Now I want to talk quickly about DKIM, right? Uh, so domain keys identified mail, right? This is non-repudiation, right? So SPF is anti-spoofing, DKIM is non-repudiation, DKIM digitally signs outgoing email, right? Um, and it includes some, but not all headers. It turns out that the sending server gets to choose which headers. Oh, baby, right? Um, so as it leaves the origination server, that server says, hey, here are the following fields that I'm going to uh, digitally sign. Um, and the receiving server then uh, basically will read the DKIM signature. Um, it'll obtain the public key via DNS, right? And calculate a signature. Now, this one, I'm not as worried about changing, right? Because it's a digital signature, right? It's not a config line that's, that could add or delete servers um, over a couple of days, but it still is, uh, you know, still obviously good practice to know that this is here. The reason I bring this one up is that, um, and we won't explicitly deep dive any further into DKIM as we get into packet analysis here, um, but I, I did want to mention this because this is a spot where I've had folks bump up with me and they're like, oh yeah, well that, that message, uh, I... I definitely didn't type that message. And it's like, cool story, right? Um, you may not have typed it, but, but we can confirm, um, we can confirm that uh, this email uh, that was sent, right? Um, you know, at least for the fields that are DKIM protected, that server encrypted it with its private key or the private key has been lost, right? Um, so you can imagine here, that's a, a, a that's an uncomfortable place for somebody to be in. And as a matter of fact, and I'm not getting political here, let me be like abundantly clear about this, right? Um, but uh, the uh, Podesta emails, you may remember this, DKIM actually played a role in this, whether or not you, you, you knew about this. Uh, Podesta, uh, with some of the leaked emails that came out, um, tried to deny like, oh, no, 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 I definitely was, I didn't take that Uber, I think it was an Uber or Lyft or whatever, rideshare, right? Uh, picking up in some interesting locations. And I'm just going to leave that one there. Um, it turns out, I, and I, I actually, well, it doesn't matter which rideshare service, um, I'm pretty sure they both use DKIM. And so you can say whatever you want about it, right? But the reality is, right, the, the, the two line, right? So who is the email going to? And uh, among other fields, the subject, the body, et cetera, those were all signed by a private key, right? So as threat actors leaked these emails, you could literally go in and be like, hey, is this good or not, right? Like meaning, has anything been changed here? And, and I, I, I conflate that, or conflate, I compare that against, uh, you know, against let's say a, um, gosh, like leaked files generally, right? Like I don't know to the threat actor modify those, right? Matter of fact, actually, since we're on Podesta, we might as well talk quickly about the, you know, like there were lots of files dumped. There was one, uh, you know, rolling up to the 2016 uh, thing with Gutrooper 2. Um, and it's like, you know, for metadata says four minutes of edit time for a hundred page document. Like, I don't know what you did to that document, but I know it's not the original. And by the way, it's in Cyrillic alphabet and Che Guevara is the author and not that doesn't even pass the sniff test, but the emails, right? I, I can't say for sure that the user behind the keyboard typed that specific email. What I can say is from the moment it, it arrived at your email server and was digitally signed, those fields did not change. Now, I've got a question here uh, from attendees. Uh, what approximately what percentage of email servers are configured with SPF? Is it common? It's incredibly common, as it turns out, in, in the vast majority of businesses. Um, now, the, the thing that I didn't deep dive on here, and I'm not going to spend any more time on it specifically here, but, but do go look up the difference in SPF between fail and soft fail, right? Um, so there's pass, fail, soft fail. Um, there's, there's a lot of spots where, where people will basically be testing an SPF configuration. And you should test, by the way, like because if you get this wrong, you have a misconfiguration, 
right? Uh, basically, your legitimate email looks like spoofed email and, and servers will reject it. And that's like a resume updating event, right? Um, so, but just know that while I would say the vast majority of business email, uh, business email domains are protected with SPF, a lot of them don't hard fail, they soft fail, which is kind of a testing mode, right? Um, and so I, there I can say whether or not it passed, meaning like, was it an authorized server at the time the DNS lookup was performed? Um, but, but it doesn't provide the same level of spoofing protection uh, because it, it basically leaves it to the server to decide, hey, uh, do, you want to, do, do you want to dump this uh, message if, if it looks like it's spoofed or not? And, in, and specifically that soft fail, generally folks are like, nah, fail open because you know, that, that soft fail is very much a we're in testing mode kind of piece, right? So uh, that was a great question, by the way. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to move forward here and we're going to get into the packet capture. So uh, one more time here uh, in case you are new. Um, I say new, but you, you can't, as you join Zoom, go back um, and grab any, um, well, anything, right? Let me discard that and let's get into the packet capture. And I've got too many Wireshark windows open. I should have totally killed Wireshark windows before I jumped in here. So Let's start with basic email and we're going to get into SMTP, right? And by the way, too, if you have any other questions as we go, um, oh, there is actually one more question here uh, that I've got. Mark is typing the answer. Uh, is one better than the other SPF or DKIM? Um, you know, that, I mean, yeah, I, gosh, uh, no, uh, they are different. They're just foundationally different. It's like asking, you know, like, is which is better, you know, a potato or a turnip? Actually, that's obvious it's a potato, but but you get the idea there, right? They're, they're kind of two different things. And, and and actually DKIM and SPF are so foundationally different that even that comparison is bad. I'm gonna leave it to Mark there. Mark, Mark already handled it, so game on. Um, okay, uh, so SMTP. So you can see here my port 25, and as a matter of fact, let me go ahead. I just realized uh, that this is probably small for me, or sorry, small for you. It's fine for me, but probably small for you. Let me just make us a little bigger here. Cool. Okay. Um, so you'll notice here uh, ports, right? So we see port 25. I want to take a look here at uh, basically take a look at email. I'm going to go to right click. Oh, that's IMAP. And right, let's see about SMTP. Let's just filter on SMTP. We'll start there. Um, so I'm going to filter on SMTP um, and we can effectively get some, uh, get some TCB stream data here. Um, now, when you first, uh, basically when you first connect, right, you're gonna see this either a hello or an E-H-L-O. Um, and if this, that's a server sending that back, right? Um, and the E-H-L-O basically is the extended hello. Um, as you can imagine, right, over time, uh, you know, SMTP has become more complicated. Uh, we have wanted to add additional features to it. And then there's that pesky RFC, right? And how do you, how do you know whether the server is like old school or extended version? And, and so basically with the ESMTP here, you're saying, hey, I, the mail user agent is saying, hey, I, I speak the extended version of this E, right? Um, and basically the server's coming back and saying, got it, right? So we, we also do, um, and basically say, hello instead of hello, right? So the old school servers say hello, uh, which is incredibly uncommon today. I mean, like that's dinosaur museum level kind of stuff there, but fossils, right? That kind of stuff. Um, but uh, alas, you should expect to see this, uh, this EHLO uh, pop up a bit there. So uh, that said, I'm actually going to show you another thing that I use here a lot, so I don't have to go pop through and find the right TC, right? There's no right or wrong TCP stream. Um, but um, one of the things that I'll do here is statistics and conversations. And if you're not familiar with this, uh, your conversations, and unfortunately the font on this doesn't change, right? So the font, you, you noticed here before the font got cool, uh, here it just doesn't because I don't know, right? Yeah, it's free software, you get what you pay for, I guess. Um, but uh, the conversations show us who's talking on the network. There's another interesting one that we haven't talked about in our, our various, uh, uh, you know, various uh, webcasts here. Um, and that's also the uh, protocol hierarchy. I also like this to get an idea of what's in the actual packet capture itself. Um, and so I get a chance to see just at a very high level, what did Wireshark decode? What did it detect uh, that might be interesting here? And you can see here, of course, uh, SMTP accounts for a large portion of the, uh, uh, basically a large portion of the pack, the overall packets, right? Um, so, but that one's not the most interesting one for us. Uh, we were looking at was effectively our conversations. And, and you can see this broken down at a, you know, at, and again, remember this is an export, right? This isn't the whole everything going on, right? Um, but it's an export from a slice in time. 
And you'll see here then as well, uh, basically the <coughs> communications, uh, we've got, uh, you know, basically uh, 103 talks to 104 and 105, right? So um, now you'll, you'll notice here, we've only got two effectively conversations at the, at the IP layer, right? Now I wanna be abundantly clear that that does not mean that there were only two connections if we're talking TCP or um, you know, two different sessions or whatever we're gonna call it on the UDP side uh, between these. It just means that this is the total list of who talked to who period, right? So 103 had a conversation with 105, uh, 103 had a conversation with 104. In this packet capture, we do not see that 104 and 105 talk. Now, that's actually because of the way this is filtered uh, to get it exported, but, but did want to kind of throw that out there that, you know, again, at the IP layer, not as easy to, uh, uh, well, I say not as easy. Uh, this may represent multiple communications uh, that have occurred. And in fact, you can see that when we hop over here to our friend TCP. Um, and as we jump into TCP, I, I now have the full list of uh, basically the full list of communications, um, and you can see your address as well as your ports. Now, this random high port over here, this is what we call an ephemeral port, um, and so this is the port that's chosen by the TCP stack, uh, or TCP IP stack, I guess, technically, um, that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that uh, is um, uh, basically it's chosen by the client. Um, and then, of course, you can see the server port as well. Uh, we've got several here for port 25. You may remember port 110, that was POP3. Uh, so we'll take the oh-so-brief look at POP3, but it's not going to be on the test. Um, and then we'll take a quick look at IMAP as well, and that's port 143. Um, so uh, here, I'm just going to go sort by, uh, basically sort by port B. Now, if you're asking why, if you're thinking like, how did he know to sort by port B, right? Uh, well, it's because that's a server, right? And I can tell that because everything over here in port A is an ephemeral port, right? Um, you know, it's a random high, whereas my, my well-known ports, right, are here on port B. I can infer that dot 103 is an email server um, because we have, based on the number of packets and number of bytes transmitted, uh, we have a realistic expectation um, that these were successful connections. I mean, like every reasonable expectation, meaning that this thing is listening on 25, 110, and 443, SMTP, POP3, and IMAP, respectively. That said, it's rock and roll here. I'm going to right click on this guy and I'm going to say go apply as filter. I'm selected and I want it in both directions. So this is my Konami cheat code, if you will, for saying, hey, show me at a high level, right? How to go find some, you know, some interesting connections. Um, and so, and by the way, here too, right? This is a fairly large one. Um, and that probably means that there's something cool to see there. It definitely means there's something cool to see there. Uh, so then I'm going to go in, I'm going to follow TCP stream. And so now we can go and take a little bit, uh, a little bit better look here, um, and you can see indeed uh, <clears throat> base 64 being used for the uh, uh, excuse me, base 64 uh, returns uh, being used, and you can see your uh, basic our, our login, um, and then from there we can see indeed that uh, <clears throat> basically that there's an email message. Now this looks weird, right? Um, if if you didn't know what was going on here, this looks weird. Now all emails, it turns out, is seven bit ASCII. 7-bit meaning that the high order bit in every byte is zero. And, and what that means is everything's printable. And, and if you're curious, like, how does that work with images and attachments? I'll show you in just a second. Um, but that said, because it's all 7-bit ASCII, everything's 100% printable. And the, the mail server knows that when they have a line by itself, followed by the period as the first character on the line, by itself, right? So you have a line break followed by the period. That's the end of message, right? So you whack enter again here, end of message. Server takes it and says go, right? And that's how it knows the message is done. Um, and it says, hey, okay, cool, you're queued, right? Now you can actually go and tell that if you're super interested or using Netcat, um, good old Netcat, right? And actually interact with an email server if you're so inclined, right? So um, you know, and, and actually walk through and learn a lot more about the protocol here. This one's a super, oh, matter of fact, there's that transfer encoding seven bit. Uh, this one's a super, super, uh, you know, easy to easy to follow, uh, follow example here. There's not a lot, really, there's just not a lot happening here, right? Uh, okay, so neat. Let's go grab one more of these, and then we'll take a quick look at POP3, and then we're moving on to uh, IMAP and phishing because that's way, way, way cooler. Um, so let's see, I think I grabbed that one first. Yeah, there we go. Um, and stream. 
Okay, and so you can see here indeed that uh, John has replied to Jane, um, and uh, John has replied to Jane, and you'll notice here again, uh, dot by itself, whack, done, right? So the server says, hey, that's a dot on a line by itself, we are set, um, and uh, once you whack enter behind that, the server says, hey, uh, now we're going and, and running with everything else here. Um, again, uh, generally the same, you've got the EHLO, and in fact, the server is sending its version back as well here. Um, wanted to show one other neat trick here too uh, in Wireshark. Um, let's see, so TCP offset 0x, oh, sorry, TCP offset 13, 0x12, right? So if you're not familiar with Wireshark um, and how you can do some of the filtering, uh, you know, one, you can click on practically any filter or sorry, any field down here, you right click and be like, hey, uh, set this up as a filter, right? And you can set it up as an and, as an or, or whatever. This is one of my go-to filters here. I'm going to drop this into the chat um, so that you've got it as well. Let's see, chat and bingo and change to everyone. There we go. Okay. Um, and so I like this because what this does, if you're not familiar with offset 13, Offset 13 is the flags field inside the TCP header. And the flags are where, well, I mean, the flags where the flags live, right? And we know that every connection has a sin and an ack, right? Or sorry, a sin, a sin, ack, ack. Now that's for a three-way handshake. There technically is a four-way handshake that's esoteric and whatever. Uh, but for a three-way handshake, we know every connection has exactly one sin, ack, right? Um, so that sin, ack, by doing this filter, this allows me to go in and very quickly identify, right? Notice here it says displayed 18. That allows me to quickly identify that there are exactly um, 18 connections here, right? And by the way, if you line that up with my TCP, notice there's 18 connections here, right? So this is another way that I can quickly get here. Now, um, again, the statistics uh, tab typically works a little better for me because I've got better high level information, but but sometimes I'm working with mass volumes in a tool called T-Shark. And I wanted to make sure to arm you with this, uh, you know, if, if you're doing like mass volumes of traffic. T-Shark can do statistics and, and weird manipulation as well, but that, that's like, again, it's just a little cheat code for me. Um, so, okay, let me come back to statistics again. And uh, very quickly, we'll take a look at POP3. Because again, it, I mean, I guess I'd be remiss not to since it's here. Um, and we'll do a quick follow TCB stream. And you can see here, um, indeed, <clears throat> basically that uh, the user logs in uh, so, or the user says, hey, uh, this is my username and then sends the password in plain text. And I'm sure you can imagine here why this is like, yeah. Um, if you used to go to DEF CON uh, back in the day when Wall of Sheep was still a thing uh, before all this privacy regulation and whatnot and, and, and legal liability potentially and whatever, the Wall of Sheep used to actually track people's passwords and the number of people that brought POP3 clients to DEF CON, even ShmooCon for that matter, was just astounding. And so you would see the usernames and passwords floating by and you, you, you know what happens next, right? But, but alas, um, th this kind of highlights the, uh, again, it's, it's just a plain text password. Um, now, notice here, you start with a list or they start with a list. Um, and say, hey, um, we've got the, uh, basically how many messages do I have here? It says, hey, you've got one message. And it says, okay, go retrieve message ID one. And you're getting the whole message, right? Um, is this ideal? I mean, you, you tell me, uh, IMAP is certainly a better, uh, a better way to do that than grabbing the, uh, grabbing the whole message. And in fact, we'll hop over to the IMAP piece in just a second. Let's see, here we go. I think that's the right one. Let's see stream. No, of course it's not, because live demos for the win, right? Okay, uh, let's see. One, one more, one more shake at this, and then I'm going to go hop over to my IMAP, um, where I know I'm set, right? Um, so my IMAP capture, where I know I'm 100% set, and. Bingo, right? That's what I was looking for. Okay, um, so <clears throat> basically here, uh, what you're seeing is instead of downloading the whole message, right? Notice here initially that it's doing a quick fetch. And this is what I was talking about earlier where you have some of the traffic local, or say some of the traffic, some of the metadata or, or data around the message local. Um, and that would be this in initial fetch where you effectively are grabbing the fields that, that you request, the server responds with this. And then you're like, oh, okay, now go grab, let's go, go get the body for me. Right, um, and so and here it says, hey, go go grab your uh, go grab your text, 
And so you can see this then becomes this multi-part, uh, basically this multi-part retrieval here. So typically most IMAP clients are gonna go grab enough to show you that a message exists and then wait for you to click on it before it goes and downloads that to your, I say most, but particularly as you get into mobile, right? The, those IMAP clients typically will go that, uh, go that route. Okay, um, so that said, let's take a better look at this in the IMAP folder, and then we'll jump into phishing to round out our afternoon together. Well, morning, depending on where you're at. Um, so here, I'm just going to go ahead and do an IMAP. Um, and let me go ahead here and, oh, follow TCE stream. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> here's the example of the uh, basically or a better example of of IMAP where we have multiple multiple messages, um, you know, on the uh, basically multiple messages on the server, and you can see here uh, basically that um, the uh, <clears throat> basically that the server uh, or sorry that the uh, client is requesting to go fetch the metadata uh, for each one of I guess you call this metadata I think of it as metadata but effectively the the summary right summary uh, data around the uh, the message itself right um, so. This helps me, uh, and, and here very quickly, one of the things that I want to throw out here is if you think about a BEC case, and particularly a BEC case where a threat actor gains access to uh, gains access to one of your email accounts, and you have packet capture, you can say what they did and didn't see if you have the packet capture. Um, if if you are dealing with um, you know logging on some of your on-prem email servers, and again webmail whole different thing going on. You're not going to have packet capture from your, let's say, Microsoft 365 instance to the threat actor, right? You may even have it to you, but not to the threat actor, right? So, so I did want to highlight there that, you know, this is going to be a limited use case for like an on-prem system. But if you still have an on-prem email server um, and a threat actor compromises one of your accounts, you can use packet capture to say, did they see the actual message body or did they see the message subject? And if you do any date, if you do any, uh, you know, incident response and into the disclosure operations around that, you know, there was a world of difference between the threat actor accessed, right? And typically on the logs, what it's going to say is they accessed at a folder level. And they're like, oh, they accessed, yeah, at the folder level. And then the presumption is that they got everything because because I typically don't have more granular logging, often don't have more granular logging than that um, until I get to an endpoint. I don't have the threat actor's endpoint, right? So, but here I can say the threat actor, right? The threat actor, well, okay, assuming this is a threat actor, let's play that this is a compromise. Um, they have uh, they have done a fetch for these seven messages, right? But but did they have the whole message? Do they have message bodies, right? Um, and the, the answer here is no, right? We don't have message bodies, not not specifically, uh, you know, not specifically here, right? Um, so just well, I guess I take that back here. I, let me take that one back. Further down, we do have message bodies. My, my apologies here. Uh, we did the initial fetch. And ah, here we said, OK, yeah, to, to do one and then messages two through seven, which is all of them. Um, and uh, we asked to do the uh, basically the body peak. So we didn't get attachments if attachments were here, but we did uh, basically get a, a preview of the uh, basic preview of the body. So this would be a but but again, you have full content here to be able to say, what did the threat actor see versus what does you know, versus what's what's fully in the uh, in the email. OK, so I want to transition here to phishing, which is probably uh, not probably it's one of the uh, one of the big use cases for me. And we have two phishing demos here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and grab uh, this one and I'm going to do my fun statistics and we'll go to conversations and let's take a look here. TCP um, and we see here, let's see, uh, 529K, uh, 44K. Uh, this, this looks fun here. Let, let's take a look at this, right? So I'm going to ask to go look at that and let's follow my TCP stream. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> remember I said all of our email is seven bit or all SMDP is seven bit ASCII. Um, this is where we get into these, uh, basically these content boundaries, right? So this boundary here basically says, hey, where does one where does one piece of the message end and the next begin, right? Um, so here you can see that we have one set, right? Notice here our content boundary begins. Um, and it says, hey, uh, this, this piece is, is plain text, right? Um, and then we have the same message in HTML. 
And you've probably observed this before, right? Where, uh, you know, if you're in your, uh, well, maybe you don't. If you're an old school like me, you've definitely observed this before where, you know, you're in your nice email, uh, you're in your nice email, uh, uh, goodness, um, my nice uh, email um, uh, user agent, um, and it, it does the HTML perfectly. And then I'm in like my Linux, uh, you know, old school mail user agent, and it's like all plain text, right? And so what's happening there is effectively the MUA is choosing which uh, HTML versus plain text uh, to display. I can also say, hey, I don't want to be bothered by this HTML markup stuff, um, you know, and any of the potential, uh, you know, I mean, today, very, very small, but risks that go with that. Um, and so just show me my, my email in plain text, right? Um, so, uh, by the way, right off the bat here, um, the fact that, uh, you know, it's, it's got a shipping a tracking number um, and there's a mention of a credit card, um, it's been charged. This is a common one. We see this all the time. Um, I almost actually fell victim to this uh, last week. Um, I hate to be that guy, but like somebody sent me an invoice um, for, and they're like, you got charged. And it was like four times what I expected it to be. Now, here's the key, expected it to be. And it was just by dumb luck, a, and I'm not going to name the company, but it's a company that I actually had just shopped at um, like two days prior, right? Um, and it's a common one. So it's, it's an easy one to kind of, you know, yeah, to kind of fall for. And I was just like, what the? And then I started looking and I'm like, oh, ha, 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 ha. I got into the headers and, and who actually sent it. And I'm like, negative Ghost Rider. But it's a very, very common thing. It's like basically the hey, man, if you want to reverse this charge, here's how to do it, right? Okay, so we've got uh, basically says, see the attached file. Well, that's never good, right? What is the attached file, right? Uh, the attached file is uh, <clears throat> basically is an attachment. The file name is copy document dot doc. And then you see this data here. Now, this is all base 64, right? Uh, if you're not familiar with base 64, um, well, probably you should be for one. Um, but uh, base 64, effectively, what we're going to do here um, is I'm going to make sure that we're only selecting the one side because that's a big document. Um, mind you, if I don't select, notice here, I'm only seeing, uh, you know, basically the transmission. Um, uh, transmission, let's see, uh, mail from, yeah, so uh, basically you're from the client to the uh, client to the server here. And so I'm going to say, let me go grab this guy. I'm just going to copy all this data. I don't want any of the continuation headers here. So I'm just going to copy that. Come on, Slonus. I do this. Save as. Be quicker to edit this. Um, but um, bum bum desktop scans and let's call this. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to save this out here and then we'll pop over here and I'm going to site uh, 2.base64. Cool. Now, now we're just going to use the uh, the power of uh, yeah, the power of page up and page down. There we go. Because I really just want to cut the stop stuff off, stuff off in the front, right? And then okay. And you can see here at the end uh, basically that we've got two equal sign. Um, and base 64 has to end on a four byte boundary. So if it doesn't end on a four byte boundary, it's one, two, or three equal signs. Uh, so now I'm just going to go ahead and save this guy. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to base 64 minus D. And we'll bring that in uh, to .b64 and write this out to, uh, I can't remember what it was, uh, copy.doc, I think. Right? And so then we'll file copy.doc. Right? And indeed, you can see that uh, copy.doc is, is actually a document. Uh, if you wanted to get into, I don't have exit tool on here. Okay, that's fine. We'll use virus souls copy of exit tool. I thought I had that on the server, or sorry, on the, uh, the system here. I'm going to go open this up and, and see what virus total knows about this, right? And uh, virus total is pretty, uh, pretty conclusive here. This is not a good thing, right? Uh, and when I said exit tool here, uh, basically, if I come over to details, um, dum, 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 dum. Ooh. Oh, you know what? That may be over in, uh, I think that's now over in the uh, VTI, isn't it? Anyway, we get a chance to see what this, uh, basically what this does. Um, and, uh, and by the way, too, if you're, if you're looking for the name of the tool, it's EXIF tool, which I thought I had installed on there, but I cycle these VMs so often it's, it's uh, yeah. Anyway, 
Um, so we get a chance here to see indeed that that thing is 100% malicious, right? Now, one of the reasons that this becomes an issue for me in packet capture, we're thinking, why would I ever go to packet capture for this? And the answer is that as an investigator, right, I frequently run into people helping out with the investigation and deleting stuff on the server, right? Particularly after they're like, oh man, it's like you get the helpful system admin, right? I'm not knocking system admins. I love them. They do great stuff. Sometimes, yes. Um, okay. Um, oh, I got a question in here, by the way, um, asking, can I see the SPF and DKIM information in the message PCAPs? You could. Uh, we did all this in a test lab, and so we don't have SPF enabled um, in our test labs. You won't see it there, but you will see it generically in, I say generically, but you will see it in, uh, you know, normally in your message headers. Um, so, in fact, uh, if you just, if you fire up Thunderbird, uh, for instance, um, you know, and uh, connect to Gmail, um, you can then go look at headers very easily and you will see your DKIM and your SPF headers there. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I, I just saw that. Uh, my apologies. Um, okay, uh, so I've got one more or time for one more packet capture here uh, before we wrap it all up, right? Um, and uh, <clears throat> actually, you know what? Rather than me doing the other phishing example, which turns out to be a PDF, the payload delivery format, I want to take a moment here to answer this, this question live, because I think that's probably going to be more valuable to me jumping through that packet capture there. But um, the question is, what can you say is the value add of doing this manual analysis of emails versus using tools like Fish Tool? Um, first off, um, I used to sit on the other side of the keyboard, right? Um, and I, I can say that as a threat actor myself. Um, and so government sponsored, right? But, um, but uh, I, I can say that, uh, you know, threat actors study your tools. And they study how to bypass your tools. And so if you are relying 100% on a tool, you become the tool, um, not in a good way. Um, and so, you know, the, uh, I would say you want the knowledge to be able to, want the knowledge to be able to go in and, uh, and, and do, that, uh, do that analysis. The other part is uh, very often before I get a chance to go use uh, some of my third party tools, I've had system admins already help, help me out, right? Um, so, Mark, I noticed that you, uh, so help me out, like delete something, and, and if I've got the packet capture, I've got ground truth, I can replay this across as many different tools as I want, and I don't have to worry about what the system admin may or may not have done, right? Um, now, Mark uh, has noted one, uh, he'd like to answer the question live. Mark, do you want to jump in and answer this, or did you want me to take that? Oh, sure. Um, so, ahead, uh, Abdullah asked... Um whether the packet captures the between um, uh, endpoint and exchange server or exchange and perimeter device. Uh, the answer is endpoint and a mail server. It wasn't actually exchange, it was H server that we set up in a, a test lab. But um, so between the mail server and an endpoint device. Fantastic. Thunderbird, I think if I remember rightly. Yeah, no, that sounds right to me. Uh, I didn't think it was exchange, but uh, in this particular case. Um, but no, th thank you, Mark, for that uh, for that clarification. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I do want to, again, I've got a whopping like minute and a half left here. And so um, I, I want to thank SANS, uh, or sorry, thanks SANS. I want to thank Endace yet again um, for bringing this content to the SANS community. Um, this is the third one of these that we've done. Again, we're, we're running a, well, technically the fourth webcast that we've done, one on just generically operationalizing packet capture, We've had three here where they have created packet captures and then released them to the community. And I'm just, I mean, I, I, I can't say enough about this. Um, it's been fantastic for them. And, and if you think like, man, you rushed through this. I did because there's so much to cover, right? Um, we, we seriously could have spent, you know, half a day talking about H or talking about some of the SMTP verbs um, and some of the IMAP verbs and some of the, but, but hopefully this is enough to get your feet wet get you thinking about some of the stuff you can do with packet capture specific to email analysis. And if you want to come back for some unconventional uh, uses of packet capture, we're discussing that tomorrow. Uh, just by dumb luck that it lined up back to back there. Um, but we'll be, me and Mark will be back here tomorrow, um, as well as I think, is it Christopher Ray, I believe? Uh, sorry, Carrie Wright. Carrie Wright and Michael Morris are going to examine uh, some additional uh, some additional packet capture uses as well. Um, so join us tomorrow to discuss some of that. Uh, folks, PCAP or it didn't happen. And, and with that, I'm going to turn it back to Carol to close out the webcast. Carol? All right. Thank you so much, Jake, for your great presentation and to Endace for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. 
To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.